get started. Hi, my name is Tim Nolte, um, and uh, <laughs> you'll have to bear with me. This is my first time actually doing a talk at a word camp, well, doing a talk in general. Um, my wife gives me a hard time. I was, I was telling this gentleman, Tony, uh, earlier that my wife gives me a hard time that uh, whenever I get around people, I love to talk. So I figure, well, I love to talk, and if you get if you catch me in the hallway or something, I'll probably talk your ear off. Um, so maybe that means I can speak. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, so uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I actually don't use WordPress in my day job. Um, I actually work for Sprint. I'm a computer programmer for Sprint. But I've been involved with WordPress for about the last, well, what, t uh, 10, 10 plus years. Um, at least, yeah. I started using WordPress like in 2006. Um, set up my first uh, personal blog then. And um, yeah, but before that, I actually got into like web development in 1996. Um, that was when I was in high school. And our school had uh, internet, and I got connected with a local company. And I did their first website. It was all HTML. Um, we didn't have things like CSS or, um, or JavaScript back then to, to work with. So, you know, things like image rollovers. I mean, I did, I actually dabbled in a little bit of uh, C code to like do image maps. And I mean, this is way technical, geeky stuff. And I was just trying to learn it and get things going at the time. Um, but yeah, so with WordPress uh, in two th 2006, I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a blog. I was, uh, wanted to have some place to start sharing my thoughts. And so I did that. Um, I also, I did, uh, it was kind of, 2006 was about the time when podcasting was really pretty popular, and um, I had gotten connected with some people on some things and wanted to share my thoughts for that, so I started a podcast, and um, was doing that for a while. Uh, along those, throughout that, those years, I was actually doing a lot of PHP and development for ministries and whatnot, did a lot of different sites. Um, when I moved here, actually, I'm originally from Minnesota, and when I moved here uh, to Michigan about uh, 11 years ago, um, oh, yeah, actually, so it would have been more than 10, but anyways, 11 years ago, I got a job with a Sprint affiliate company, and that's where I, I was doing PHP again, no WordPress, but um, that's where I got into the telecom industry, um, did some work in manufacturing with a lot of PHP, um, anyways, that's, that's kind of my, uh, my background, um, Right now, uh, on my freelance site, I got a lot of stuff about WordPress. I like to do WordPress stuff on the side. Um, I've done some subcontracting. <coughs> I've done some side jobs for a new site. I just um, helped a friend uh, stand up a new Woo uh, WooCommerce site. And uh, I'm working, I've got, I have a lot of pl plugins or like two, at least two plugins that are like in the works and I'm trying to get them done. And, um, but there's a lot of like, uh, uh, life happens and whatever. But, um, on my personal site, I'll post about that stuff. I'll, my personal site is kind of like everything my whole life. So you'll see probably every day, well, not every day, many days, like four, four plus times a week, you'll see I'll post I run. Um, I'm a runner. You maybe saw that when uh, uh, the speaker info came out, and uh, so I post that. But, but I like to post uh, the whole gamut of things, my family. But ndigitals.com, that's where you'll find like most, most of the WordPress stuff and links to my GitHub and whatnot, um, which is there too. Uh, I've contributed to um, a lot of WordPress things. Um, even like some of the plugins you may have heard of, like, well, like uh, uh, WordPress uh, SEO, the Yoast one. I've done a little bit contributing to that. Sim uh, seriously, simple, simple podcasting. I've contributed to that. But, uh, and I'm always looking for if I'm using a plugin, if there's some issue, bug, or feature, sometimes I'll just fork it and submit to it. But, um, you know, and, and while I've been doing a lot of that, um, and you know, the hot topic these days is, uh, is the word DevOps, right? And so really, um, this talk is, is kind of about what is DevOps, what does it mean, and then how to start applying that, and I'll kind of go through a little bit of some stuff that I've done over the years um, in, in that realm, and then and too with WordPress specifically. But, you know, really DevOps, it's, it's a software engineering culture um, and practice that aims at unifying software development and software operations. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the programmers and it's, the, it's those that are doing servers and infrastructure and 
trying to get all that working together so that both sides um, can can make the best use of their time. Um, and uh, there's a there's a site um, in an article called uh, "Revisiting What Is DevOps" uh, by uh, 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 Mike uh, Lukides, and in there it says it's always easy to think of DevOps or any form of, uh, any software industry paradigm in terms of the tools you use. In particular, it's very easy to think of if you use Chef or Puppet for automation configuration, uh, J Jenkins for continuous integration, cloud providers that you're doing DevOps. But really DevOps, it's not about the tools, it's about the culture and, and the, the mindset and what, you, what you're trying to accomplish between both developers and, and those in, in the operations side. Um, so, you know, really DevOps aims, it aims at shorter development cycles, increased deployment frequency, uh, more dependable releases, and close alignment with business objectives. I mean, really the, the point um, of implementing DevOps practice is about saving time, money, resources, and being smart about that. Um, you know, and, the, and what ends up happening is there becomes this intimate understanding between the development side of things and operations side of things. Um, it's very easy for us as developers to get focused on the tools we're using and, and those things, and sometimes get to have a disconnect between our business, the business users, um, other teams that are that we that are supporting us. I, even at Sprint, um, you know, I'm a developer there, and primarily we focus on just our code, and we have servers that it runs on, but we're not the administrators of our servers, we're not the administrators of our databases, you know, so we have to interact act with them. And even there, we have challenges of there being this disconnect of, well, we're doing this thing. Well, okay, well, we don't support that. And so working together to have this kind of cohesive um, environment where all the teams and pieces are working together. Oops. So, you know, Time is valuable, so automate all the things. So the, that's, we, hear, we hear a lot about automation with you know, continuous integration and DevOps, and you know, that's the focus. Um, and like, if you've done it more than once, you need to figure out some way of automating it so that you don't have to manually do it ever again. And so we've got all kinds of solutions out there to do that sort of thing. Um, however, <laughs> you know, time is valuable, so the, really the important thing is to automate the right things. Um, you know, I love XKCD, you know, talks about, okay, here's, you know, the theory, okay, I've got some work to do and, you know, it's taking, I need to write this bunch of code, so I'm going to do some automation to make things, give me more free time, right? But the reality of it is we start working on code and, and just, you, you want to do this automation, well, then the automation takes over and then the real thing never gets done, you know? So there, there's a, there's a, sometimes there's a disconnect between what we need to do for what tools we use. I mean, even ramping up and, and, you know, like, okay, what's the hot new tool? Well, what time are you gonna invest in learning that tool before you start actually reaping the benefits of, of that and in, in doing automation and all, everything that's involved with that? So, so what does DevOps have to offer Word, the WordPress world? Um, you know, again, we're talking about increased productivity, increased quality. Uh, reduce time to, to delivery uh, of releases. And when I talk about releases, I mean, this is like if, we're, if you're a business and you're actually selling plugins, selling themes, or even if you're just doing stuff on WordPress.org, or even just for clients. Um, if you're doing custom plugin or theme development for clients, how do you get things fixed? How do you think get things deployed um, in timely manner with, with quality? So in terms of an increased productivity, um, you know, we're talking about developers, designers, testers uh, can work on solving new problems and not repeating the work needed to solve previous problems. So we don't want to keep solving the same problem over and over again. So once we've figured it out, how do we keep moving forward? You know, and, and some of those things that, that we have to deal with are, you know, environment setups. And um, I love these types of things like, okay, Sometimes I know, even my experience at, at Sprint is you've got these very complex environments and nobody knows how the whole thing works together. And that's where DevOps can come in and start, whoops, sorry, uh, bridging that gap um, between, go back, thank you. 
um, between what, what the different groups are doing. And so everybody can start having an understanding of what the big picture looks like. Um, you know, with repetitive tasks, you know, like, like we were saying before, we want to try to automate everything. We don't want to have to repeat ourselves, you know, and do the same work if we can find other ways to do things. I mean, earlier on, you know, the guy's talking about the local dev and, and setting up those things to quickly spin up new containers for, for local environments. Um, those are things that are going to help move things along, keep things um, going faster, you know. And of course, <laughs> What's the definition, definition of insanity? You know, re repetition, repetition, repetition. So the, the next piece, too, is, is the business workflows. And that's, that, again, that whole overall, what's the big picture and how does, uh, how does, how does, how do all the pieces fit into uh, what the business needs? Um, I mean, when, when I talk what the business needs, I mean, this is even um, if you're, an independent and you're just doing something with wordpress.org, well, what are the things, you know, as you're releasing plugins or releasing themes, what are all the pieces that you're doing uh, to make that happen, you know? Because some of that, too, there's, you got support. You've got um, not just the development, but then you've got support after the fact. Or um, if somebody finds an issue, are you gonna be open to collaborating? Are you gonna document, you know, how people can contribute? Um, so all those things are, are workflows and, and processes. You know, and this is kind of how are we, you know, from a d developer standpoint, how are we branching and whatever. That's, again, it's workflows and processes. So the other thing, too, is increased quality. You know, and we can, a team can rely on testable, reproducible, quantitative results that give a clear picture of the current state uh, of the product. Um, you know, and that can be accomplished through, through unit tests and standards and business requirements. You know, and with unit tests, it's like requiring code that is tested that fulfills the requirements. With your standards, it's like can, can code automatically be checked against well-defined business industry standards? Like one thing I do with a lot of the um, plugin development that I'm um, working on is I started automating and building in the WordPress coding standards, right? So it's like I have a plugin I'm working on. I want to submit it to WordPress.org. It's like I want to make sure my code right out of the gate as I'm developing it is following the WordPress coding standards so that when it comes time to submit, it's not gonna get rejected because, well, you're doing all this whatever over here. And you know, one, one thing too, right now there's, there's kind of this shift with uh, you know, object-oriented PHP versus kind of the old you know, procedural classic WordPress development. And some of the WordPress coding standards are still kind of in that procedural uh, world, and so if you try to do things where uh, more object-oriented, some of those things might fail the WordPress coding standards. So, you have to, so it's nice to have those automated uh, te uh, testing and, and evaluation to, to check those standards. And then business requirements, um, by having tests and the standards, and you can, you can have those actually built into your automation to produce reports that show, hey, this plugin, it's actually fulfilling all these requirements, or this theme does these things. So with reduced time to delivery and releases, you know, when standards and best practices are followed, there, um, there are less mistakes and less changes required to prepare for a release. Um, you've got automated tests, tests. You've got an environment set up where you can have user testing on demand, you know, with the plethora of options like like Docker containers, and you know now there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, just a whole gamut of um, solutions for spinning up things to test small pieces. You can do that all on demand. There's a lot of services, uh, you know, Travis CI, uh, and some of those are ones I'll, I'll kind of mention later too. But those have a, the ability to just click those, kick those off on demand by any user, and then you can test and, and, and evaluate that. Which, in the end, because you have those things in place, um, you can have more releases, right? So you're not stuck with, okay, I've got to go through, because it takes so long to come out with a fix for my plugin or theme or push something to a client site. You know, we're going to do it like once a month, you know. Um, nope, you can have things in place to like basically identify it, fix it, and within a day, boom, you can push out a release. You know, I look at um, some of the changes with like, 
you know, and Google got a lot of flack about this um, initially. What was when they started going to like these, their build numbers weren't like you know version three dot zero three dot one dot one. They started going to it's like basically every time I mean constantly coming out with updates, and it's like now we're up to like I don't know sixty version sixty nine. It's like historically that's unheard of to have a version number of your software at version sixty nine, right? It's always well no you got these major milestones, so your first release in the first you know phase is always one, and then later down the road it's version two. Really, all those version numbers and that that way of thinking. It's, it's kind of an older way of, of doing things that doesn't really matter when it comes to getting those things released and, and having a lot more releases. So um, where do you begin, right? So when you're talking about DevOps and WordPress and all this stuff, how do you, how do you get started? Um, I mean, the first thing is that it's important to take small steps, right? Like, the, the world of te automated testing, uh, getting teams working together, it's all going to be, it's a culture change, it's a, it's, a, it's, a think, it's a way to think differently. And the other thing too is there's a lot of examples out there of, and guidance on how to make that stuff happen. But you need to start small and find out what's going to make the most impact initially. Um, and here's some resources, uh, both Carl Alexander and Tom McFarlane, I follow those guys a ton, they got great resources, um, just all around. I mean, Tom McFarlane um, and Carl, they both have uh, a lot of information if you want to get your WordPress development moved to more object oriented, but then again, just with automation and testing and standards, um, they're kind of on that leading edge, and so I love to follow those guys. Um, you know, things like just, okay, how do I manage Git with WordPress. You know, unfortunately, um, WordPress.org is still using SVN. Um, so if you want to publish a plugin or a theme, it's got to ultimately hit SVN. Um, I'm waiting for the day where it can all just be Git. But again, you know, whether it's Git, SVN, or you're using Mercurial or CVS or whatever, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you got to use what's, what's best for your organization, for your productivity, um, and then figure out how to make those leaps. I mean, ultimately, you got to get it committed to SVN to get it in WordPress.org, and there's ways to do that. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, you'll see most companies um, that are doing newer plugin theme development, a lot of them are, are on GitHub. Um, it's a very common place where they're using Git. And it's like, well, but if they need to get something to WordPress.org, they got to make that transition to SBN. And so there's tools, there's scripts um, to do some of that stuff. So what you need to start off with is you need to identify your pain points, right? So you need to clearly identify those things which will reap you the most benefit based on the time you will spend. Um, you know, what are you repeating? What is taking you the most time? Um, what's requiring the most support? Um, and those are the things you start, need to ask yourself and identify from a high level to start determining, okay, what am I going to start doing in this DevOps world? Where am I going to start making changes? Where am I going to start getting the conversation going um, to, to start making strides to a, a better holistic um, uh, environment? You know, again, XKCD, you know, about spending the right time on the right things. This is a very interesting picture um, on how much time you can actually spend on something to automate it based on how many times you're doing it. And, and what, and how, like basically there's like a cutoff point. It's like if you're spending X amount of time and you're only saving, you know, a minute, uh, you, you, can't be, you, you can't spend more time to save that minute because overall if it's not being done that many times, you, in the end you lose. Um, the value of it. So again, making sure that you can evaluate, okay, how long is it going to take us to, um, to use this new tool because it's supposed to save us time. If it's going to take you more time to learn that tool, to apply that tool, then you're going to reap, you know, reap back. You know, it's, it's return on investment, that whole thing with business. Um, then you have to evaluate, okay, maybe there's an alternative tool. Maybe the way we're doing things is what's best for us now. But then other things like culture and the conversation and getting teams together, some of that, 
um, is even more valuable than the, I mean, it's for sure more valuable than the tools because you're getting people to have those conversations, to communicate and get on the same page. And then you can start having the, the, the next level of conversation of what tools to use because you're all on the same page. So the other thing, and I kind of mentioned this already, is there's so much research. I mean, with the, in the day and age of the internet, there's pretty much not anything out there um, that's available to us. You know, and so I, I appreciated when Michelle was talking in her last, uh, in her talk about, you know, this, this battle between, you know, what do you use and, you know, I'm going to write my own stuff because it's always better. Um, when you're getting started in this area of automation, like, go find what other people are, are doing and using. I mean, that's, that's where I started. Um, even using things like Travis CI, you know, I've noticed, oh, hey, this plugin, they're using Travis CI. So what are they using? Okay, I can see they're using Gulp or they're using Composer, NPM, whatever, along with their, you know, plugin development flow. And so I've slowly, it's like, okay, yeah, I see that time savings. I was able to do, you know, add that to my, my, process, my workflow, my process for, for development, and it didn't take me much time. And again, I'm evaluating, okay, if it's gonna take me two weeks to get going on this to make it work to give me some benefit, then yeah, maybe I'll hold off on that. But if it's a matter of just you know, one command, you know, I'm already using um, Composer, right? So if it's another Composer requirement, boom, I add it, and now all of a sudden I can um, start using it. Case in point, I just added uh, PHP MD, which is the mess detector um, for code evaluation. So I just added that to my Composer. Um, it's there. The next step for me is I'm going to actually have that, you know, fail or pass on my my tests. Um, so you know, there's a lot of free and paid paid services for your source control, for continuous integration, reporting. Um, there's a lot of plugins. So for uh, I'll also give you an example. There's a, there's a plugin that um, does some direct like GitHub integration. Um, automation scripts. There's like some shell scripts or different things that um, can be used to, to, to automate those pieces. Um, so example time, and we'll see how, whoops, we'll see how this goes. Um, so there's a couple, there's a, there's a plugin like I mentioned, and uh, there's also a theme that I, I used to maintain that I, that I also did some of this with. Um, and I will bring that up here. Let's see how, let me know if this uh, font is too uh, small. Is that pretty small? How's that? All right. So, actually, I'm just going to go. All right. Uh, where is my file? There it is. All right. So, like, one of the things, you know, well, let me take a step back here from, from the Travis. So you can see um, this is a plugin that I'm working on right now. Um, and I'm using Composer. I'm using NPM. I've got files, uh, configuration files for, for unit testing. PHP CS is the code sniffer, which um, implements my uh, WordPress coding standards. Um, and then I've got in my Travis CI configuration, I've got it running those things. And one of the nice things about Travis, well, not just Travis CI, but Travis CI, C, CI as an example, is I can set up in there to actually run and test my, my plugin. Um, for one thing, I can specify the different branches I want tested. So like right now, I've got this 1.0 dev branch, which is where I'm doing most of my work. And I can have it build that um, automatically for me. But then I can have it test, you know, uh, which WordPress version, which PHP version, and multi-site. Um, so 
me, this is my plugin. Nobody else has to deal with it. And I'm like, I'm going to go through and I want to test it all and make sure I can va evaluate and say, hey, this, this is what it's going to work with. And I'll know. Um, and even my unit tests, like, uh, that's part of it. Interesting thing of it is that when I, with Composer, I decided to add the PHP mess detector, like I mentioned. And the current version of the mess detector that I'm running actually requires PHP 7. So, of course, um, the act of running that failed all of my <laughs> uh, pre-PHP 7 builds. And I saw that right away because I had this set up. I added it, I added it to Composer, up, up, updated my Git repository, my tests automatically ran. All of a sudden, I get a Slack and I get an email saying, oh, your build failed. I'm like, what, what did I do? I didn't even change any code yet. Oh, because I added that in. Um, you know, and that's one of those things where okay, is it important that the build gets failed because of you know, a particular development dependency? Yes or no. And that's where you can, you can go and you can set up you know, in your Travis CI uh, what actually runs when. And so you can have specific builds that say, okay, you know, I'm going to test this WordPress version and you know, this PHP version, but I'm not going to do you know, the, the mess detector uh, tests. Um, you can see here, like, here's where it's running my PHP unit test. Here's where it's running um, my code sniffer for my WordPress coding standards. You know, and it's got a check in there. So this is a script that Travis CI runs, and it's detecting, okay, here's the version. Pass that through. Um, here, okay, is, it, is my CI, C, C, CSI build saying use uh, the, the coding standards? There's like one job that does the coding standards. The other ones don't. So it's like, you know, and it's all configurable. Um, and then you can see I've got after success um, that I'm actually running, there's a service called uh, Code Cove that um, does uh, reporting on the results of all your, your tests. And so you can get reports on that. And that's that whole business workflow, right? Like being able to, at the end of the day, look at uh, everything that you've created and have like somebody that's not the developer, not the technical person say, have, a, have something they can look at and say, okay, hey, well, I can see that, you know, the quality of the code's going down, what's going on, you know, and you can start having the conversation, oh, well, the timeline, you know, we just had to get it in to, you know, get it shipped. Um, okay, well, what was the hindrance, you know, and so you can start having those kind of conversations. Um, Uh, the other piece that I wanted to show is what's up here. Sorry. So there's a gamut of services. That, um, that I've used, like I said, Travis. Another one that I've used is um, uh, Code, Sh Code Ship. And it's very much like, like Travis CI or, um, so, or Deploy HQ. And in, in this scenario here, um, this actually was a theme that I built for, uh, I was managing my church's website, and it was a custom theme I did. And, like originally, um, I actually had this, uh, when the build would, would pass and, and be complete, um, I actually R did, used rsync um, to upload it to, uh, to the website. Um, but then we actually switched hosting from a, uh, a VPS hosting to, to Pressable, uh, managed WordPress. And of course, they didn't support rsync. So I was like, OK, now what am I going to use? So then that's where. Um, you know, I, I switched that to uh, basically F, FTPing. Um, and, you know, that's where it's like, okay, being able to figure out, okay, what do I need, where do I need to go with it and how do, I, how do I get there? And so, again, it was like I'd been doing a lot of stuff with rsync before with Jenkins and CI, and so that's where it was available, so that's what I used to use. Then later on it was um, 
nope, can't do that. We switched hosts. Now what do I do? Well, okay, what's the thing next, the best thing to get it done to keep my automation in place um, so I can quickly deploy? The other thing too is um, in the Git repo, uh, there was an integration branch which I had set up specifically to go to a test dev site. So that way, can make code changes and it would automatically push to a live environment. You know, and things like Travis CI, it develop, it, when it runs all those tests, it actually runs those in small containers with the PHP version you want, da 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 da. Um, and this is more for, okay, I'm pushing it out there for like user testing or I want to see, you know, interact with it and, and whatnot. Um, and then especially for um, kind of your production builds. And this would be like for a client or for your own internal um, purposes. Now, the other thing you can do too is with this sort of setup, you can have, you can use a script to automate pushing your builds to things like wordpress.org um, when you want to do a plugin or a theme release. Um, so, so, you know, back to the configuration that I'm using, you know, PHP code sniffer for WordPress coding standards, PHP unit for unit testing. Um, I've actually got uh, some gulp tasks. I'm using gulp um, to do, to check uh, and, and build the internet internationalization for the plugin. Um, and then even, uh, it's kind of handy that there's a little gulp task that does um, WordPress readme to markdown. So basically my WordPress readme file um, is the same readme that shows up in GitHub. So GitHub is all marked down, but there's like, it's the WordPress um, plugin and theme readme, it, it's got a form of mark markdown, but they're different. So this lets you basically maintain one file and automatically generate the other one. Um, so, you know, in practice, you know, with having your automation set up, the unit testing, I mean, what I'm able, I'm able to do, when I showed you the console I'm using, um, I'm able to run all kinds of, my, all kinds of that stuff locally. Um, I can run the code sniffer, I can run PHP unit, I can run all that locally before I ever even commit. Um, then when I commit, then the test automation t comes into play. I mean, my local environment is, I think it's a PHP 7.2 with Nginx, right? Well, if I need to test under other conditions, um, yeah, I could try and have the, all those setups installed on my local machine, or I can just push it out there and specify what I want, and, and it'll test all, in all those different environments. And that's the one thing, too, like when you're talking about, um, you know, plug-in development, theme development that's going to be used by the masses, it's important to be able to test how does that thing going to work, depending on which PHP version, which WordPress version, are they running under Apache or Nginx, um, all those different environments. And when you've got automation and things like services like Travis CI, right? I'm using Travis CI or CodeShip because I don't want to have a whole server that I've configured with Jenkins. You know, and I've done that before too. Um, it's, again, some of it's all stepping stones. So if you're already using Jenkins in your organization, use, you know, use what Jenkins has and you can use same, a lot of the same scripts with Jenkins. Um, but then that's the thing is you can automate those tests against your final release. If it passes, you just let it automatically deploy. Um, you can, but you don't have to. Uh, that's, that's the nice thing too, is making sure that you're doing what you're comfortable with and what, is, uh, what, you're, what, what the business needs are, what the organization's needs are. Um, so, and yeah, with deployments, and that's what I was showing you a little bit. So you've got, you know, basically publishing directly to the servers. So that was like the, you know, the rsync and the FTP, uh, deploying plugin and theme update via a plugin. So there's a plugin I started using. Um, it's, uh, well, I've got, it, I've got it in the resources, but there's a plugin that, it's a GitHub plugin, and you can install it in your, dash, in your WordPress install, and you can directly install plugins or themes from GitHub, and it manages that and looks at, and you can switch branches, you can um, update the plugin directly from GitHub onto your site. And that's one way, um, like right now, I got a client site that, um, the WooCommerce site I think I was talking about earlier, I actually installed that plugin on their site because a free WordPress plugin that we were using 
I actually made code changes to, and it is a, it's a .org plugin, but I submitted a pull request, and I'm waiting for those code changes to actually be accepted by that free plugin, but I needed those features in the client site, and so I'm gonna support them, so I'm pointing that plugin to, to GitHub, to my GitHub version, and that's what's uh, driving it. Once it gets submitted, then I can just have it you know, install from, from the, from the WordPress.org repository. So that's another way of um, being able to deploy uh, your plugins and themes. Um, and then the other thing too is deploying, you know, your plugin and theme update, updates to WordPress.org. Um, and, you know, again, that's all, that's all pretty much made, done through SVN. So once you've gone through, I mean, there, I'm not going to go through the, the process of how you get submitted to, to the WordPress.org repository. They've got documentation out there for that. Um, but once you actually get your plugin or theme accepted, then regular updates are all going to come through SVN. Um, and there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, if you, on my slide deck here, um, I've got them all listed out and you can get them online too um, for the services, plugins, there's scripts um, that will automatically, you know, deploy and take your Git however you want that, you know, if you want specific tags used or specific branches, you can configure it to do that. Um, and then it'll automatically uh, com uh, commit it to SVN for, for your rollout. So, um, with that, that kind of concludes my talking. Um, I wanted to make sure I left some time for Q&A and I wasn't sure how long it was going to take me to talk anyway. So, any questions? Yeah? Have you ever heard of uh, GitLab? GitLab? Yes, yes. Yeah. I Yeah, I did just see even some recent articles about that as well. I haven't, haven't used GitLab, but yeah, it sounds like a pretty, pretty nice setup. Well, and actually uh, what I saw recently too was they um, are now supporting uh, total uh, local uh, installs of GitLab. Um, so you don't have to, you know, there's a lot of, me being a, a developer at Sprint, um, there's been for many years a lot of concern about information outside the company. Um, surprisingly enough, we're actually moving to Office 365, um, uh, which I was like, really? Sprint? Office 365? But yep, we're moving there. And um, so, yeah, GitLab, you know, for any companies that have concerns about, oh, my code is out in the cloud, you can have that all local. I mean, that's the things like using Jenkins local. Um, you can set up your own local Git central repositories. I mean, that's nice about Git too in general is it's, decentralized version control versus SVN, you know. I, I tell you, I, I don't know how many times I've had felt the pains of SVN at work when I use Git at home. And it's like, I always, the, my coworkers give me a hard time because like, oh, you always talk about Git. It's like, hey, you should try it sometime. It's way better. But again, you use, it's way better to me. Like for me, it's way better. Um, I appreciate it a lot more, but uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How does your, uh, does your company know that you, I guess they do know you have side work? Sprint, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I don't do anything in, I don't do any side work in the telecom area. Yeah, and, I understand. Yeah. They, they support, I guess, in a way, your uh, in other interests outside of... Um, I don't <laughs> know. I mean, I think they're probably pretty indifferent. <laughs> what I do on my own time, I don't know if they... They necessarily care. I mean, Sprint's a pretty big company, but yeah. I mean, I yeah, I'm not, I don't hide the fact with my team when I talk about stuff. And yeah, it's Sprint's a very interesting place to work. We have a lot of contractors and offshore, and so yeah. But yeah, and that's the thing too. Like, I mean, in my day job, I'm using Java, .NET, C Sharp. I'm not using any PHP. I'm not using WordPress. And so it's very, very easy for me to keep those things, those worlds kind of separate. Um, you know, I do sometimes like my, what I do off hours as a developer, I try to bring and continue to move the sprint team along and get, say, hey, you know, there's these other ways of doing things that we might consider. But it's a bigger corporate environment. We have company standards that we have to abide by. So it's not always easy to do that. Yeah. Did I see the other day that Microsoft was buying GitHub? Yes, so that is true. Um, I, I saw it, and I, my, initially I'm like, ah. But I think I'm, in, I'm encouraged by the fact 
you know, seeing what, what Microsoft has done with .NET Core and moving a lot of things to open source, um, I, I feel like this move is falling in line with that. And so it scares me less than if it was, I mean, the only thing that, that I'm slightly concerned about is, you know, they got their whole team foundation services, which I've used with Visual Studio stuff for, for work. Um, uh, actually, my last job, but, um, so I am slightly concerned, like, okay, now they have, like, to me, two competing products. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always the question. Like, I mean, I know a lot of people have moved away from MySQL to MariaDB because MySQL is owned by Oracle. I mean, when Oracle bought Sun, that was the big thing, right? Like, what's going to happen to MySQL? Like, the whole internet, like, open yeah. source community uses MySQL. Well, then, of course, the MySQL developers came back and they reforked it, and now we have MariaDB. And so, like... Now a lot, I mean, G Google moved to MariaDB, you know, so, and I'm using MariaDB. I mean, I moved in that direction too. So yeah, I mean, time will tell um, with, the, with, with the weight that Microsoft has, the, the funds, the resources. I mean, even the entire like Azure, you know, platform, I'm hopeful that this is all gonna be a positive thing. I mean, even Visual Studio Code, right? I mean, that's a free tool. I mean, that surprised me, like when that came out, um, and that supports has you know support for GitHub and things. And so, yeah, we'll we'll see. I I don't I, I have a hard time believing that Microsoft making those kind of choices and it, it that it's it's going to be some means to all of a sudden suck it all back in yeah, and it's all going to yeah, be pri no, proprietary and expensive again. <laughs> yeah, so. But yeah, like is GitHub at risk? Are the, is GitHub gonna, gonna go away? I, yeah. Well, I mean, GitHub has paid. You know, they have, they already have. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. But what's gonna happen to the free side, right? I mean, I've seen that before with other services. It's like they've changed, and now the free, like, uh, interesting uh, Evernote, for instance, like when they started changing what you got with Evernote, and like, oh, if you wanted to have it on multiple devices, like my wife and I used. Evernote on our phones and on our computer, and we had the same account, and we sy it synced across all of them when they changed, like, oh, well, I don't have a better solution for uh, how we store stuff in Evernote, and so I guess we'll pay for a year, and of course now I'm stuck and I've been paying because I forget to cancel and yeah. haven't fully moved on to other things or pulled my content <laughs> out, and so, yeah. So Microsoft, if they decide to change GitHub, we might find a lot of us caught in that too, where it's like, well, I got my stuff there and I don't know where else to move it. I mean, the nice thing about it is Git, right? Yeah. So it's technically it's decentralized. It's just that happens to be a one other location of the repository. So it could compl I mean, there's a lot of, you know, the DevOps infrastructure, how things are tied together, connected to it. But there's other solutions out there. Like, I mean, um, Bitbucket exists. They've got Git, Assembla. They've got both Subversion and Git. Um, I mean, actually, uh, I was going to mention with Assembla, because they have f Subversion, um, what I'm planning on doing is um, setting up some of my workflow. I've actually already created a repository for one of my plugins, an SVN repository that's going to mirror what WordPress.org is. So I can test out my WordPress.org SVN submission process with Git. I can do that with Assembla. It's all mine. And then when I'm ready to actually submit to .org, I can submit it and I know, hey, this is all going to work and I can continue to move on forward. So. Yeah, so there's a lot of other options out there, both paid and free. And I mean, that's one thing about Bitbucket that's a little, like I use both Bit, Bitbucket and GitHub. And, and one of the differences between the two is GitHub, it's free for public repositories, paid for private. Whereas Bitbucket, it's actually the opposite to a degree. <laughs> I mean, actually, they, they give you private ones for free. And so I, I use Bitbucket for like my actual, my, my local WordPress development environment is all um, in a repository using Composer that builds it all out. I actually have that in a private Bitbucket repository just because I've got stuff that's kind of like my own there. Um, and I'm not necessarily ready to, it's using the uh, WordPress skeleton uh, build out. So, um, yeah, anyway, sorry. I, I, I mentioned earlier I like to talk and I also, <laughs> like, I also like to segue, you'll find out too. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I've got that here. That's the one, WordPress, WordPress GitHub plugin updater. Um, it's out on GitHub, yeah. 
Um, it's pretty slick. It, um, it can do both public and private repos. You can, you can give it a private uh, repo key, a token, so that it can access your private repos, whether they're your personal or like if you have a, a corporate uh, GitHub uh, repository. That's one thing too I've done is like my freelance InDigitals, I have an InDigitals company kind of repository that that's where all of like, that's gonna be like the main release of the plugins and I've forked that to my own GitHub and that's where, all, where I'm doing my development work. Just like, I'm only one guy but I still like to operate in terms of like a team because in my day job I'm, I'm working as a team plus I wanna have that environment set up so like I wanna accept if other people wanna work and submit to my plugins, like I appreciate that with the plugins or themes that I've contributed to, you know, I can fork theirs and, you know, make changes, submit a pull request, and um, I just love that open source kind of community, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, when you're developing plugins, do you use any kind of like template systems? Um, like for front end type stuff, for like th for themes, themes you're talking, or, or, uh, you, or what do you mean? No, Um, so for plugin development, I mean, I do use the WP CLI to basically scaffold out a plugin, um, but I've been with the plugins that I'm working on right now, I'm kind of going more of the um, object-oriented approach. So you know, I move I move things to a source folder. Um, I'm I'm using I'm actually using Composer to um, build out my uh, loading for my classes. Um, so I am using that, and that's the thing too, is I use Composer for like dependencies. I'm using it for like unit testing stuff right now. Um, but my, uh, my WordPress development environment actually uses Composer. There's the WP Packagist um, repository, which basically all like plugins and themes that are in the .org repository are available through Composer. Um, so I actually use that. Um, but that's the thing too, like, um, I have another plugin where I've got a, um, a particular PHP package, and so I've got that in Composer as a requirement, so it pulls that in. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that's exactly where you're going, but yeah, I don't, other than the scaffolding and kind of using um, that uh, kind of more object, like Tom McFarlane, uh, some of his plugins, and, and Carl, um, how they've got them structured and, and doing things from a more uh, object-oriented way, that's kind of where I'm following, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So when you source, when you source control, you source controlling the, the plugins, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't source control like an entire WordPress site. Um, I, know, like, I know there are you know, agencies where it's like, okay, we've got the entire client site is in a repository. Um, to me, uh, managing the source for like the the core WordPress core stuff is just it's a waste of space um, that's where like my my WordPress development environment um, I've actually using compo there's a composer package that actually installs WordPress core so I don't my my dev setup with composer doesn't actually have WordPress core in it but as part of the you know checking it out and then running uh, I check out my repository, then I run Composer update. It actually downloads core, installs core, and sets all that up. So, like, even if it was like a client site and I wanted to do something like that, where I, I kind of have the client site with what plugins, I would probably use Composer um, if I were going to do that. But yeah, for plugins, yeah, I'm just it's just the plugin is in uh, in GitHub. So the entire website, it's more like backing it up. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's I mean, different. yeah, that's very different. Yeah, backups. Make sure you back up. <laughs> um, actually, even your dev environments, I, I ran into, I, I actually use a, it probably sounds crazy, I use a Chromebook, um, and it supports Android apps, so I actually use Termux, which is a, uh, basically a Linux container, and I have MariaDB and Nginx and PHP, the whole works, plus uh, I use NeoVim as my IDE. Well, I had a, Google pushed out some changes, I use their G Suite, the free legacy version and uh, my whole Termux 
environment was blown away. So I lost my whole dev environment and I hadn't done some git commits or git pushes and so I lost everything and so like, ah, I need to have a backup for that. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Um, yes, yes it does. Uh, I'm pretty sure it does. Yeah. And then, uh, which automation step that you've taken do you think has saved you the most time? And that will be different for everyone, right? Right, so right. The, like, the payoff was the best for you. Yeah, I would say the, the, the one for me would be, um, the, <laughs> More recently, it's the scripts that I wrote to actually set up my dev environment. Um, but for, from a deployment standpoint, it was, uh, I would say, like using CodeShip and having uh, that actually pushing theme and plugin updates that I was using before, like that was always a huge time saver. So I, we're out of time. Um, I will be uh, at the happiness bar kind of at the end of the day. I'll be hanging around. I'll have my lunch here. Um, I brought mine in. So if you want to talk or have more questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks. Thanks.